Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you're a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. This week, John sits down with Jen Gresham, who's the founder of Work for Humanity, whose mission is to reimagine the American dream. Jen's organization is creating a more equitable and enjoyable future of work so that workers, businesses, and communities can thrive together. In this episode, you'll learn about the power of curiosity, how Jen defines leadership after 18 years in the Air Force, why we need to redesign entry-level jobs in America, and how to convince business owners to build an employee-powered organization. Now here's your host, John Dijonis. Hello, revolutionaries. This is John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. This week, we have Miss Jen Grisham, who is a scientist, entrepreneur, military veteran, and keynote speaker. And she has served as a high-performance coach and business strategist for nearly a decade, helping hundreds of people around the world find more fulfillment and financial success in their work. She has founded Work for Humanity to reach a larger audience and bring innovation to workforce development and leadership training. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Where does this podcast find you? I am in Sunnyvale, California. I've only been here for about a year. So I moved here from Seattle, Washington. Okay. And I'm bad with geography. Where is that by? What major city? We are near uh, San Jose. It's basically the heart of Silicon Valley. Oh, okay. Okay. And so you'd either fly to San Francisco or San Jose. Yes. Either one will work. We're, yeah. we're pretty close. All right. Well, so so we may come visit you. Jen, tell a 20-year Air Force veteran, which means you're also a badass. Uh, <laughs> Tell us about your scientist, Air Force veteran. Before we really get into, you know, this, your company, Work for Humanity, which is a nonprofit, tell us about how you got to your peak uh, of, of your thing of being on my podcast, which, you know, is, you know, it's all downhill from, from here. Yeah. So what led me to today, this moment, everything that has been leading me here? Right. So yeah, so I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I, I went to the Air Force Academy for college, was a biochemistry major, but really toyed with also being an English major. I mean, it was a tough choice. So I am also a poet, uh, have you know published a book of poetry. You know, one of my bosses once described me as the most curious person he knew. And I think he meant it as someone who finds things really interesting and didn't mean that I was just odd. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I spent 20 years in the Air Force doing various science jobs. And one of the things I really appreciated about that experience is that we would get assigned to something, right? So it was all around what the personnel department needed. So my very first job coming out of, at the time I was I had just gotten my master's in biochemistry. And the guy said, great, we're going to send you to a, a lab where you do nuclear treaty monitoring. And I was like, wow, that doesn't sound like biochemistry at all. And he said, oh, you know, chemistry, physics, it's all the same. Nuclear, what was it? <laughs> nuclear treaty monitoring. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so we would I get. Think that means you're you know, kind of a watchdog to make sure no one's doing anything they shouldn't be doing. Exactly. Okay. Good, good. That's exactly right. So that was my very first job in the Air Force. I had a team of, you know, about a dozen non-commissioned officers and we would get samples from all over the world. You know, sometimes we would have to work 24, 48 hour shifts, you know, to get data out quickly in case somebody was worried about something. But 
I have never felt so supremely unqualified for a job as I did for that job, right? My, I mean, my training as a biochemist had nothing to do with that. I mean, my very first day on the job, I went to a meeting and I didn't understand any of the words people were using. And so really, you know, that was emblematic of my entire career in some ways, because I was constantly being put into positions where I had to teach myself everything I needed to know, find my own mentors, get them to help me and still run a team, you know, and, and inspire confidence in them that I knew what I was doing. Were you uh, immediately a leader in when you were? Oh, okay. Okay. It's one of the nice things, right, about the the military. I mean, here I am some, how old was I? Probably 23, 24-year-old kid. And I'm not only leading, you know, a dozen folks, but they're all much older than me. They have much more experience. And um, you, uh, I, I, I'm assuming you have credibility issues, right, with them <laughs> or you? You're, well, A, you're a woman, you're a kid. And you don't have the experience that, you know, all these men have in this room. And I always say, you take it back to any job, the newest employee in any job, you come work for me, I come to work for you, is the dumbest employee in your building for 30, 60, 90 days, right? And that sucks, right? <laughs> it sucks. You don't speak their, their lingo. You don't know where, you know, when they say, go get me, you're like, hey, I don't know what that is. And where we keep it, right? So that just sucks being, you know, new in any space, but I can't imagine in this. And hindsight, was it, I know it's good for you, right? It's good for us to be thrown in those positions, but was it the right decision for them to put you in that? Or is there something they could have done differently? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think in an organization like the Air Force, right, their challenge is always trying to match up. Here's where we have a hole and here's who we have available to move. And, and you just have to make those work. And so I, I really do feel for them, although I didn't maybe at the time I yeah. was a little unhappy, but it, it ended up being a great position. And I think I learned so much about leadership in that role and what leadership really is, because I think when you get put into a situation where you do feel really confident, where you do feel like the expert, right? It is so easy to fall back on that rather than seeing that my role as leader is really to support them in doing the best work of their lives. So this is where your curiosity gene kicked in, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, you must have had incredible moxie at 23 to be able to pull this off, right? Even if <laughs> I don't know if I didn't know anything at 23, but if I did, I still would have been in over my head in, in, in that position because I would have been a know-it-all or I would have been trying to demonstrate, I know, which is the worst thing you can do. It, whether you do or you don't, you know, that's the worst thing you can do. It's the worst, right? Yeah. And so I just spent so much of my time asking questions, explain how this works. Why are you doing it this way? And, and you know, you there were times yeah, where like, uh, maybe put their guard down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think you know, coming to it with humility, you know, not trying to be the know-it-all, not trying to be the hey, you know, you I've got bars on my shoulders. Them, like you were, you were questioning them. You were questioning them to learn not to point holes in in what they're doing. That's right. So, That's what right. was your leadership epiphany? You said it really helped you uh, understand what leadership was. Do you have? Yeah, well, I mean, the way I describe it, I don't know that I could have put it into these words at the time, right? right? right, right. But but what I really took away from that, and I think it has um, crystallized over time, is that leadership isn't about being in charge. It's about supporting and developing and caring for those people in your charge. And it really requires a level of trust, right? Trust is perhaps the most important thing you need to build on your team. And when you do that, really amazing things happen. Let's, before you go into it, let's, if, if you remember, uh, let's say that again. Leader, yeah. uh, leadership is, is, is not about being in charge. I don't know if I have it correct. Yeah. Let me finish that. Because that, that Yes. Yeah, it's oh. about developing and supporting and caring for those right. in your charge. I love that. All right, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, I know. And, and so really, I, I mean, I don't know how I knew to do this at that time, right? I, I had no experience 
I will say that the non-commissioned officer in charge uh, who worked for me, so he was the most senior NCO on my team, was fabulous. I mean, he taught me so much. And it was really, you know, that's where it all started, was building that trust relationship with him and really listening to him, you know, and, and right, he would tell me things and I would go with it and it would work, right? And then I, we just kept iterating on that. And over time, I got to the point where I was knowledgeable enough that I could suggest things and that would work, right? And so it really started to build that team. And, and one of the other- Is always good, right? Yes, because yes. You don't understand that, we've always done it that way because, you know, nothing out the other ways don't work, which is, you know, that's luckily why consultants have jobs because we go in there and, and can see it from a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, there were just times where talking about this supporting people who work for you and who are in your charge. I, I remember one time we had these safety inspections that, you know, we would go through every quarter. Uh, I, I have to be a little careful about how much I say here because I don't mm-hmm. want to get anybody in trouble. But but in essence, let's just say we were sort of getting ready for that safety inspection. And somebody went through and saw that we had missed one of our weekly walkthroughs, right? And they said, oh, just go back and back to it. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. And I mean, you can imagine, right? Thing, right? About teaching you about, you know, the, the whole logic and correct me if I'm wrong, about making your bed and polishing your shoes is the attention to detail. And I think I've only gotten this from movies, but, you know, you don't do that right. How can we trust you to have our back in, you know, a real situation? Yeah. And, and it, I mean, this was one of those moments where, you know, my team was saying, oh, are you sure about this? You know, we could really get into trouble. Right. And the person who was pressuring me was saying, look, we will personally fine you. And I mean, they were threatening a lot of stuff. And I said, no, right. This is an integrity issue. And, and this goes back to that issue around building trust. You can't build trust if you don't have integrity and you, you're not willing to display it when it matters most. Right. Uh, and in the end, right? So we had the inspection, everything was fine, right? I mean, there was there were no consequences at all. And I think that really changed things for our team to say like, hey, you know, we understand what's important here and we she has our back and we can trust her. Right, right. Okay, so we have this great military career. Yeah. Um, and, and how did you end up founding Work for Humanity? And then let us know what that is. Um, But yeah, so it was a bit of a circuitous route, you know, I mean, so when I left the military, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I actually ended up becoming a writer for a period of time. So my last assignment had been in human performance augmentation. So I'd been the chief scientist for the human performance augmentation lab for the Air Force, where we basically took ordinary performance and made it extraordinary using technology, psychology, and biology. Sorry, that, there's so much there I could go into, but I won't. But suffice it to say, I was a writer for a while, was talking about this huge career shift, right? So this was my, hey, I got to play in science, and now I want to play as a writer. And people started asking if they could hire me. You also me. got to play in military, and now you're a civilian, right? Right, right, right. Well, that's right. We couldn't be farther from the opposite as far as like, I was always narrow and deep. I wasn't smart enough or good enough to wear more than one hat. I had to eat, sleep and drink one thing. And you are so talented and have (laughs) so many different hats and have been successful at so many different things. This is like, you know, really intriguing me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then, I mean, in some degree, right, this is what the Air Force demanded of me, right? Because every job was like that nuclear treaty monitoring job. Every job, I went into something not knowing anything about it. Get comfortable because you're going to be uncomfortable really quick. Exactly. Right. We moved every three years. So, All right, so you're um, a civilian, you're writing. Yep. Okay. And people started saying, hey, can I hire you to be my coach? And I was like, what, what do you want me to coach you in? And they said, well, we want you to show us how to change careers the way you've done. And I thought, oh, gosh, I don't know anything about that. I mean, I really felt like I just kind of stumbled my way into that position. But enough people kept asking because I was writing about this on a blog at the time. 
And so I said, you know what? I'm a scientist. I'm willing to experiment here. Let's play. And so I started coaching people on career change, figuring out what do they want to do and how do they build a new trajectory, usually without having to go back to school. That was almost everyone's requirement. And I learned so much from that experience. I just You're can't tell you. the most, right? Yeah, right. I'm the most curious person you'll ever meet. And so what I found was one, I was shocked at how unhappy people were in their work. And that was true regardless of where they were starting and where they thought they wanted to go and how much money they made, right? I worked with senior executives and I coached like a guy who'd been fired from Applebee's. So, and everywhere in between. So one thing that struck me was how unhappy people were, but the other piece was how much potential was being left on the table, right? So that guy who got fired from Applebee's, I was able to help him him get a sales job. He'd never done sales in his life. And in three months, we got him a job in sales. He ended up becoming the top salesperson for his company, which basically enabled him. And he was one of the key people who enabled that startup to have its IPO. They went public. Think about that, right? Applebee's was like, no, we don't need you. But within this guy, within three months, we were able to turn him into the top sales agent for our company when he'd never done it before. And so that just really hit me, right? Like how much potential is being wasted in organizations? And at some point, right, is I could help one person at a time create new career trajectories and go off and do amazing things. And it just wasn't enough. I wanted to do that at scale. And so the question for me was, how do we really unlock that human potential that's being wasted in all of the various places? And there's a couple of things there, right? So this is where, you know, we talk about workforce development. How do we help individual workers really see their potential and develop it? But another huge piece of it is that leadership piece. And what we find is that many people don't know how to do this. And it really is a shift in that leadership of acting more like a coach than a manager. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And so work for humanity. You're yes, mystery. sorry. I love no, 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 no. No, I want to tie it all together. So let me state, you know, share with, with our listeners that your mission, it's time to reimagine the American dream. We're creating a more equitable and enjoyable future of work so that workers, businesses, and communities can thrive together. I love that, but let's unpack it, right? Because we have obviously at least three stakeholders there, the workers, mm-hmm. the businesses, and mm-hmm. then the communities and how they benefit from it. Now, when I first read it, this is what my first thought came to what it really meant. And I don't know if I'm at the far, but let's bring back the middle class. And yes. I don't know if that's true or not, but we don't have a middle class and there's such disparity. And, you know, the rich are the only ones that can afford to go to the best colleges, which perpetuate that college is no longer a thing that can get people, you know, to the next level. It's more of a, a separator that, continues that disparity. I don't know if I'm off, but help me translate what your mission is and what's the cost of if we don't do this. You really nailed it, John. I mean, that that has been the pebble in my shoe, so to speak, right, is that disparity. And again, I want to just really emphasize that it's not just economic disparity, right? What you find is that when we do look at that level of enjoyment and satisfaction, both on the job and outside of it, there is a huge disparity. And I really feel like, you know, when we think about, we we actually brought together a group of experts to talk about what would we want the future of work to be? If we could leverage technology and design any future work that we wanted, what would that look like? And really it was saying, you know, why can't it be that everybody has a job that allows them to thrive socially, emotionally, financially, intellectually, spiritually, all of those things, right? Work is such a huge part of our lives. So if we want to improve people's lives, we have to improve their experience of work and the opportunities that work brings them across their life. And so, you know, I think that was the American dream, right? That's what the middle class was supposed to provide. And we've really lost sight of that as a country. And the fact that yeah, we- Is that because of corporate greed? 
I think that's a part of it. I mean, I think that's a big part of it for sure. You we know, got, there was a, we got CEOs just making ungodly money. And in most of the U.S., the minimum wage hasn't changed in 20 years. Right. right. I mean, you yeah. Know, such a disc. And sometimes I, you know, after 30 years of, of owning, starting and, and owning four businesses, I start you know, questioning me and like the backstory was hard and all that. But then it's like, oh, my God, you know, is this is this is this success? Am I sharing it? Am I making sure that everyone is better off? And I, what I think the best leaders, best companies do is they train and build and develop the whole person. Right. Yeah. Not just how can Jen, you be more efficient, more productive and more profitable for me, but mental wellness right? How you can be better or, or, or maybe you don't struggle from it, but, but someone in your family does, right? And, and, and better at, at finances because you may, depending on, you know, where you went to school, where you grew up, you may not have gotten that and you don't understand how to be smart, money savvy, regardless of your income. So I'm jumping ahead, but uh, help me with that. Yeah, I know. It's just so true. I mean, and I think it is to me so much of the narrative has been pitting workers against businesses. And, and I understand why. Right. I mean, when we talk about unions, for example, and the, the gains that we got from unions way back when and where we are now with so little union representation. And, and you know, we're seeing things like the Starbucks and Amazon anti-union efforts. The problem with that, though, is that it really sets up the narrative that business can never do right, right? That the only way to make this work is to force people to do the right thing. And I guess what I've found is that there's an awful lot of people who want to do the right thing, who want to do what we're talking about, but they don't know how, right? They don't see how how to do it. Yeah. So, I mean, in some respects, it's not that hard, right? Right. In, in some respects, it's rethinking what some of these jobs look like, right? So with the Industrial Revolution, we really got this idea that, okay, we have the thinkers and we have the doers, right? And so the doers are going to get these really narrow tasks. We're going to tell them exactly how to do it. And we're not going to pay them a lot of money because they don't actually provide a lot of value. And us thinkers up here, you know, we're going to be directing the show. That was probably the worst thing that could ever have happened in terms of work, right? Because it set us up for what we have today, which is where you have people who have uninspiring, undesirable, low-wage jobs. And at the same time, you have leaders who are responsible for all the thinking. And in today's complex world, that's not a fun job either, right? You may get paid a lot of money, which is meant to to kind of make up for the fact that you're miserable, you're stressed out, you're overwhelmed, all of those things. And so, you know, what we're really talking about is getting rid of this idea that you need to have thinkers and doers, that you need to divide the work up into these micro tasks and really redesign it. So you have a team full of leaders. So everybody is responsible for growing and the business and growing themselves. And when you do that, one, you not only get much higher performance, so you, you get more profits, right? You get more productivity, all of those things, but you get better mental health, right? Which feeds all of that as well. Um, and then you get better communities, right? And, and we just know that, I mean, Henry Ford knew it even. When you pay your workers more, then they have more disposable income to put back into their communities. And so really focusing on what they call the fluidity of money, right? How much money is circulating in the economy rather than how much money is stepped into the bank accounts of wealthy individuals. Right. That's where we need to be <clears throat> focusing. And so you know, I think a big part of our message is that what we're talking about here is not charity in, in a sense, right? We're a nonprofit, but it's not charity. This is what's good for everybody. Everybody benefits by making this kind of shift. All right. So who do you work with? Who who hires you? How do you, what does that look like? And, and what's the steps? How old is Work for Humanity? We're pretty young, actually. I, I like to call us a fledgling nonprofit. Um, so we just did our first pilot program last year with a group of small business owners. So we tend to focus on small businesses okay. uh, because this is where the, the changes are so easy to make. So we focus on primarily businesses with somewhere between three and 55 employees 
we will eventually go higher than that. But that's where we're starting. And we focus on industries, you know, hospitality, food and beverage service, retail, other service-based industries, where low-wage work tends to proliferate. Right. And the great resignation has had to heighten the value that you can bring, even though people don't want long-term, they, they want short-term results. They just want to hire anyone with a pulse. And the two biggest mistakes leaders are making right now in all industries is, is hiring anyone to replace the turnover they have and compromising on bad hires. So how do you come in and help them reimagine and rethink this? Yeah. So the very first thing that we do is we really help leaders make that shift uh, in terms of defining leadership, like we talked about, from being in charge to supporting and developing those in their charge. If you don't do that mindset shift, all the other skill sets and policies and processes that you develop won't stick, right? When things get hard, you'll just fall back into your old ways. It's really difficult. And so it's really helping, the, the very first piece is helping owners see how they're getting in the way of their employees doing better work. That's got to be hard to do because I'm sure like, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I do that already. What you're telling me, I do that, right? Now, how do you make me realize there's gaps, significant mm -hmm. or, or whatever? How do you make me realize that maybe I'm not the developer as I should be versus the taskmaster? Bastard. Yeah, I, it's not easy. I, I, it's not. Um, however, what I will say is that there are usually some key moments. So one is helping owners see how busy minded they are, right? When you are busy minded, there's something called cognitive narrowing. So when you're in this state of constant stress of time urgency, right? Cognitive narrowing actually makes you dumb. It makes it so that you don't prioritize well. So you're in the weeds of your business. You're not being strategic. And very often that stress spreads out to your whole team. Is so that reaction mode? It's Is react. It? Yeah. It's like right. a Put lot of fires, are, right? right. That's all you're doing. I'm preventing future fires. I'm just putting out the fire, you know, and moving on to the next fire, but that, that, you know, we didn't find well, you think you're putting out fires. You're actually creating fires, right? right? right. You're lighting fires without even realizing it. And yeah. this was what, you know, again, a key moment. One of our participants was like, oh my God, I can see how I am creating. He called it the whirlwind of chaos, right? He would tell people what he wanted them to do, but then the anxiety would kick in. So he would get in their business and say, go faster. Why isn't micromanage. this done? Right. Micromanage. And then everyone, oh, okay, you know, and then they're stressed. And then everybody's performance goes down. The cognitive narrowing happens. Morale said, goes oh, down. Morale goes down. People leave. So now you're shorthanded, right? So that's what I mean by lighting fires. Okay. So you step one is, is changing my mindset as the leader, CEO, whatever, and my leadership team, to the extent that, that, that small businesses have them, okay, what's next, right? Because we have to make, I believe, the job attractive. We have mm -hmm. to you know, pay them more and find still a profit in there. So what, what would be step two? Yeah, I, I wish it were as simple as step one, yeah. two, three. It really yeah. isn't. And yeah, so I'll just to make this concrete for people, though, right. right? So one of the other things that we do is we help people see that they're really not as good a listener and coach as they think they are. I'm sorry. What? Um, uh, as good a no, listener. That was a joke. That was a joke. Oh, you were so good. You're so good. <laughs> yeah. So this is I mean, this is often a shock for people. I, this goes back to what you were saying. They're like, oh yeah, I do that. I do that. I, I mean, we I, had somebody in our program who was a certain certified coach. So she was like, yeah, of course I'm like, I know how to do this. I'm a certified coach. But what she realized in her program is that she wasn't coaching her employees. She was micromanaging them. Mm -hmm. She wasn't listening. She wasn't helping them understand their relationship with the problems that they were bringing to her. She was just telling them what to do. And so when we get people to slow down, right? So we work on that busy mind, right? We get people, one of the sayings that we use is slow down to speed up. So when we get you to slow down, then we help you start interacting with your employees and listening. 
what's the real problem here? How can I actually help you do better work? Right. Sometimes that means just getting out of the way. Have you ever considered being your own boss in a customer service career? If coaching businesses to service excellence excites you, CX Coaching may be the opportunity you've been dreaming about. Visit cxcoaching.com for more information. In my most recent book, The Relationship Economy, I have a chapter called listening, right? It's, I don't know what it's called, but you know, it being a, a great listener and on the scale of one to 10, I would, I, I thought before I did the research, I, I'm a seven, I could definitely be better, but I'm, I'm pretty good. Then I did the research and I'm like, I'm a one, like, <laughs> everything from having to come to Jesus with Jen, whose, whose productivity has gone down. Right. And Jen, if you don't get back to whatever and hit your numbers, I can't guarantee what your future holds versus coming and saying, Jen, everything okay? You know, you've always been a rock star and I just want to make sure, you know, everything's okay, right? To insatiable, one of the the phrases in there is insatiable curiosity. And that the definition is, is if if you ask a question and don't ask two to three follow-up questions, odds are you weren't listening, right? Or you didn't care for the answer. So don't ask a question because you're dying to answer it yourself, right? Hey, Jen, you got any plans this weekend? That's great. Let me tell you what I'm doing this weekend, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, this is, uh, it, it's painful. It, it's very painful and, and it's hard. You know, it's not, you know, and another tip that I learned was a myth is being a great listener is being a sponge, right? Just let you talk. I listen and, and, and throw in a couple uh-huhs. All right. And they say that's being a horrible listener. Right. A great listener is being a trampoline. Right. Where I, I ask more clarifying questions and heighten your, your, your depth and energy of, you know, you get start going and you're, you're excited to tell me why you've come up with this or why you took up, you know, whatever that that hobby is. So sorry, it's just it's more of a confession than anything. Of it, it, It's hard. It's really hard. It is and it isn't. I mean, I, I love how you described that, you know, the idea that you're not just allowing someone to spill their guts, right? right? It really is about that curiosity and understanding someone else's reality because we all are working in separate realities, right? And and understanding that is a key component, right? We may be all in the same workplace, going to the same place, doing jo- our jobs every day, and yet we are all working in completely separate realities, And so getting curious about what what's John's reality, you know, what's going on for you and how can I support you? And you may not even know the answer to that question when we start that conversation. Right. So my job isn't to tell you how to solve your problems. It's to help you understand your relationship with whatever problem you may have or to understand your relationship with whatever opportunity you may have, right? This was a big part of what I did as a coach. So I help people think bigger, right? To be more bold in what they wanted for themselves and and their careers. And and we talk about both leadership and employee here. Yeah, right. I mean, this is true for everyone. Employees too. We are just starting that work. So in fact, we have one business already signed up. We're looking for our second to bring this to the employee side and say, hey, we think it'd be really beneficial for us to be able to teach these concepts and then allow, right? Because in the past, the way this work has been done is you have some consultant come in, right? And they work with the leader and they, they kind of shepherd this whole transformation process that we're talking about around job redesign from start to finish. But but this takes time, right? You don't redesign these jobs overnight. This is a at least a year-long process, if not longer. You, you see benefits much earlier, and we can talk about some of that, but it's a longer process. What we really want to do is to equip the leader and the employees to co-design and shepherd that process themselves, right? This isn't our business, it's your business. So giving the people the skills and the mindset that they need to work together and co-design together is really our approach. And so we think we're experimenting with how that works. And so, you know, the naysayer is going to say, this is a, you know, she's a hostess, he's a cook, you know, server, whatever, receptionist. And our turnover is eight months, right? We don't want to invest 
that when they're going to leave us, you know, in eight months, how do you counter that? It just doesn't have to be that way, right? So, so one of the people who went through our program runs hotels. So she has several hotels that she runs. Her turnover rate is three percent. That's crazy because it's it's triple digits pre-pandemic in right. the hotel and restaurant industry. Right, right. So it's understanding that your experience is not everybody's experience. There are people who are nailing this, and in fact. In her case, when she opened another hotel, so her hotels were in Florida, she opened a hotel in Minot, North Dakota. She had people on her team say, I will go with you. Mm. I'll trade my flip flops for snow boots. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's the kind of loyalty and engagement that you can get from people when you invest in your employees and you and you give them a sense that there's a place for me here not only to do great work but to grow that's yeah, that's it so uh well let, let me first go back to what you you were we were just talking about is i i'll get that you know when i work in almost any industry but like in restaurants they'll say listen people are not going to work here 30 years and retire right at front line and i say you, you're probably right okay but here's the thing. Right now, your average length of stay is eight months. OK, if we could move that needle to the average of one point two years, one point six years. Do you know what that means? Like that's huge in every area uh, of it doesn't have to be that everyone's retiring. But and so that the, 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 what you just were transitioning to, I think some of the best things that came out of the pandemic and great resignation is it's reminded us that the currency for a lot of employees, especially millennials and Z's is purpose. And yes, we got fat and happy and sloppy as leaders, as businesses, because businesses was booming and sales are up and and services down and employee experiences down, but we didn't care because we're profitable or, or, or whatever it is. And we forgot how important purpose is. And, and I have found, I have over a hundred employees that work for, for me and my companies that are in their twenties and they are not willing to trade dollars for hours or hours for dollars. But man, you tie their purpose, their job to the, the overall purpose. And they are, they make ridiculous sacrifices, give up better deals on paper to be part of it. And the other thing I think is a, a critical that you, you were just going into is career path. And mm-hmm. we have to speak about the rags to riches stories. And you know, each of my businesses today are run by people that 25 years ago started off as receptionists, an esthetician, you know, an assistant, you know, and now they, they have ownership in my companies. And, and so then I could tell you, Jen, you know, Denise started off exactly what you were doing 25 years ago, and she's a managing partner of the business or in everything in between versus Jen, sweep hair or, or do whatever, greet people at the door and we'll see you in 30 years and, and we'll have a little party for your, you know, your, your retirement. Right. And not everyone's going to do that. I want people, if they only work here, you know, two years, I want it to be one of the best experiences of their career and that I help them or we help them in their next life. So, sorry, I just went on a a rant there. I I love it. That's a wonderful rant. Gosh, if every business owner did that, we wouldn't need to exist, you know? So I think there's a few things there. One is that a lot of people have the mistaken belief like, well, sure, it's great to talk about purpose if you're a nonprofit or if you're a social entrepreneur. I loved it. One time I was talking to a venture capitalist and I was talking about, yeah, you know, we, we want to do some work with social entrepreneurs. And she said, every entrepreneur is a social entrepreneur. It should be. And, and it is, right? I mean, it, that really hit me in it. Just like, wow, I how wrong I was, right? To make that, that distinction. And she she nailed it. Every entrepreneur is a social entrepreneur. And what we find is the people who go through our program really get that, right? So the, the woman who runs the hotel, she really understands, right? She's like, I am in the hospitality business, which means I'm in the joy business, Right. I bring people joy. People are on vacation and they're staying with me and they're going to remember this vacation for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Right. They're making memories as a family. But it can't only be about external, right? 
right? We got to bring joy to our, our employees. And I believe, you know, the purpose of leadership is to help people live, you know, great lives and people, Absolutely. customers, employees, community, like kind of what, what you're talking about and the profit and sales and all that will come. It will. I mean, it absolutely will. Right. And so really helping people connect those dots, though. Right. I think a lot of people, you know, we go back and talk about the millennials and Gen Z's. They really they think I can only do purposeful work if I'm saving the planet, you know, or I'm taking care of poor children. No, every job has purpose. But you you often do have to connect the dots for people and help them see how this work right here that you're doing is important and it makes a difference. Yeah. And you're not going to be doing this work forever. We want you to grow. And it's not just about promotion, right? Because so many of our organizations are set up like pyramids, right? There, There just aren't enough leadership positions to simply promote into. Right. And that's where that job design comes in, right? So so understanding that the person who's sweeping the floor doesn't have to only sweep the floor. They can do other things, right? So let's suppose they're really into tech. Well, I can't think of a business who couldn't do their tech better, <laughs> right? Great. So encourage them to do that as well, right? When, when you're not sweeping hair, then spend some time thinking about tech. Or maybe we split your time and half the time you're sweeping and half the time you're you know, building an app for us so that we can make appointments better. There are so many ways for people to grow and redesign their jobs so they aren't so narrow. I love that. I love that. So let's talk about your business model. How do people work with you? You're a nonprofit, right? So explain the business model, how companies can work for you and how companies and why they should donate to this incredible nonprofit. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. One, I'll just reiterate that we're in the early stages. So a lot of what we're doing right now is proof of concept. Someone on our team has done this kind of work for large organizations for decades, we're now bringing it to the small business community because we think this is where we can make the fastest and biggest impact. And so do Um, these small businesses that engage you, do they pay for you or how does that work? Yeah, so we do ask them to pay a fee. However, we never want costs to be a barrier to entry. So we we charge enough so that we know that you're really motivated to show up and do the work. And we think that's really important. But we never want it to be a barrier to entry. Most of the people that we work with are women and people of color. So those are communities that we know have been most impacted by COVID, have the hardest time getting financing, right? So we want to support them. And therefore, we don't want cost to be a barrier. So they do pay us, but donations are are what actually are paying the salaries of our people. So that's really important. It, It allows us to do this work. Right now, as I said, we're just integrating the employee portion of what we want to do. We're testing that out to see how it works. We'll run a second cohort of small business owners in the fall. And we are actually, I think, going to try and do this geographically co-located. So the first cohort was national. They were all over the country. What we want to test out now is what happens when they're all in the same community and have the ability to interact and support each other outside of the workshops that we're doing with them. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing right now is still in the proof of concept and experimental stage. You know, what is the case studies? Right, exactly. Uh, What's the format look like? How does this work for small businesses? Next year, we're going to get into the growth phase, right? So we'll be running multiple cohorts at once in different communities and really starting to scale this. And, And scale, as you know, is so important, And you have to be really thoughtful about it. And so a lot of what we're also looking for are people who are willing to experiment with us, right? Who have that experimental mindset, who are curious about how can I be part of this going forward? The other reason we think doing this in communities, you know, geographically co-located is important is that we're really building up the workforce of a community, right? So if we can empower and train the employees across multiple small businesses, we're really creating a pool of workers for that community that they didn't have before. Right. And again, that benefits everybody. Right. Right. And we always kind of what you were talking about in terms of retention, we imagine that some employees are going to love this model. They're going to say like, wow, I didn't think I was going to stay here, but now I see a career for me here in this small business. 
Others are going to go on to other careers. And we really encourage small business owners to see this as a benefit, right? That we want them to have bragging rights. Like, do you know where the employees go from here? They go work at Microsoft or they go work, you know, here, right? Whatever the big business is in town. And so they really see themselves in some ways as sort of the alternative to college, right? You can learn as much in a small business as you can in college, depending on what kinds of career paths you're going for. And we think that's an exciting possibility for communities. Uh, and they have less hangovers right. than you'll have in college, right? And a lot less debt. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. It's not the path for everybody. I, I mean, look, I've got a PhD. Uh, obviously, I like education. But it's not the path for everybody. And I really think, especially given the outcomes, and we, we've touched on this, right? Right now, there are an awful lot of people who are going to college and, and getting low-paying jobs, right? I think in 2018, it was just under half were getting jobs that paid $28,000 or less a year. That's not okay. And so, you know, really starting to push this idea throughout a community of good job creation. It's good for business. It's good for the community. It's good for the next generation. You know, our kids, we want to see them thrive. We don't want to see them in debt. And how do we create as many pathways to that prosperity and good quality of life as we can? And, And here's the thing. A lot of people, you know, are saying, well, that's 2018 data. It's different today with the great resignation. They're probably getting higher. But The Great Resignation will be, in the next six to 18 months, renamed the Great Layoff, right? I mean, we're we're not headed to a recession. We're in a recession. And online, all these high-tech companies have started withdrawing their offers to the college graduates. So there's a correction coming. So this isn't like, you know, what it is today. And what you're talking about is fundamental. It's not about, you know, taking advantage of a bubble on either side. So tell my listeners what work for humanity needs. Obviously, you need donations, sponsors, uh, resources. What kind of resources? uh, Give me the the gamut. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, donors and sponsors would be fantastic. I'm going to include in the show notes the uh, website to workforhumanity.org and the donation sites where if you're moved by this amazing cause, and their mission, you can certainly contribute, but other ways people can contribute or get involved. Yeah. And if you're a small business owner and, and you're interested in going through one of our programs, you can uh, sign up for our waiting list. I'll send you that link so that you have it. Yeah. And geographically, um, are there any limitations? At US only for now. Okay. Um, okay. That's the only geographical limitation. We okay. do everything on Zoom for now. We'll probably explore some in-person stuff in the future, but for now it, it's not limited. And we highly encourage, no matter who you are, to sign up for our newsletter, right? So we talk about these topics. We're giving case studies, you know, talking about how real leaders are redesigning jobs, creating better pathways for their employees and better businesses every other week. So we won't overwhelm you, but it's a way to be involved. And and I can imagine in the future, we'll probably start offering some workshops and bringing this to the larger businesses. I personally love the fact that we're focused on the small business. Yeah. And- but, you know, we might throw some bones to the larger businesses uh, yeah. in, in the yeah, future. Yeah. It'll go the other direction. Well, I mean, you know, every larger business, their success is when they act small, right? Um, right. Once they become large and act large, they lose a lot. So, and then yeah, in your blogs, you have blogs that come out consistently. And what are we, those on? Yeah, so we have have a newsletter, as, which is what I was talking about. People can sign up for that. If you don't want it to go to your email, you can also follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, if you just look up Work for Humanity, we, we post it there as well. I'll include it. And uh, yeah, you know, really, I think this is a conversation, right, that we need to be having. I'm always aware of how, you know, I, I can give you a case study and somebody will say, well, that's great for them, but that'll never work for us. Right. Let's have that conversation because I haven't seen an organization yet that can't implement these policies and ideas and mindsets, right? I just cannot emphasize the mindset piece enough to do better work, but we've just seen it over and over and over again. And I think that's a conversation we need to be having more widely. Well, the other benefit that's come out of the pandemic, the great resignation is it it has been a professional awakening 
for a lot of people. And it's similar if you ever hear someone who survived a, a near death experience, right? They go home and they divorce their spouse, they quit their job because they realize, you know, this isn't the life they want to be living. So uh, for most people, it wasn't that extreme, but it was like, this isn't the job I want. This isn't the person I want to be working for. This isn't the in, you know culture I want to be a part of. And one of my biggest gripes is when people call it a, a labor shortage. I, I call it bullshit. It's not a labor shortage. The definition of a labor shortage means we have more jobs than ever in the workforce and less human beings to fill them. And neither is true. We have the same amount of jobs we've always had, same amount of human beings. It's a turnover crisis, right? A labor shortage is a crutch. As a leader, I'm saying, hey, you know, John, you know, yeah, we're struggling because we have a, a labor shortage. No, you don't. You have a turnover crisis that you, me, have to take responsibility and own. And I don't have to have a, a turnover crisis in my company if I choose to reimagine and take on what you're talking about. So again, I will sorry. say I slightly disagree okay. on the labor shortage only because I, I think it's both, right? Absolutely. We've got a lot of undesirable jobs and you're going to have and, trouble and, filling and Jen, Just so you know, I'm cutting this part out of, of you. Just <laughs> no, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So it, it absolutely is a crisis of desirability of jobs. However, there are some really interesting trends that are happening right now. I say interesting, but like what I should say is tragic, right? So yeah. what we know, right, is that the pandemic is having a huge impact on the workforce. So um, the Brookings Institution put out some data. Now, this was um, at the beginning of 2022, but approximately 31 million working age Americans have long COVID. That's one out of every seven workers. Now, not every one of those isn't able to work. Right. But their analysis suggests that that could account for 15% of the nation's unfilled jobs. And that was prior to 15%. The Omicron. 15%. Wow. So I, I don't think people quite understand the impact that the pandemic is having just on the ability of, of working age individuals to continue to have the kind of hours that they had before. That's just the people who have long COVID. Then you have people who are caring for people who have long COVID uh, uh, or they're, they're now well, having- There is a whole, and I'm, I'm throwing fire, you know, on, uh, or, or uh, I'm adding to you and probably contradicting myself, but there is a percentage. I don't know what this percentage is. I'd love to find out of discretionary workers and discretionary workers are, People that are around the retirement age that in, in, typically are not ready to retire, right? Well, screw this with what, what's been happening. They, they chose to retire because of the past two years. So it expedited retiring. It delayed college graduates from going into the workforce because they were like, screw this. I'm going to go to graduate school, you know, and, and take advantage of my parents and all that. And then you have the any age that don't have to work, let's use women with children who choose to work a couple of days a week just for sanity reasons. And for all those reasons, they, they, they pulled back and said, you know, not now. Yeah. But, and of course, women with children are a huge That's, piece yeah. of the demographic. Right. And it's, it's not even just, you know, I can stay home, but like my child's immune compromised or my child can't get a vaccine right now. I'm not sending them to daycare. And so they didn't have a choice. They had to stay home with the kids. So you've got all that going on at the same exact time that we were in the silver tsunami, right? The, the wave of retirements um, that were happening among the boomers. And so those two things are happening simultaneously. And I think that, you know, most economists are saying that there's going to be issues with what we might call a labor shortage. It will be very geographically centered, right? So some places will have a, a labor shortage and some places won't because work is still very geographically centered. I don't think that the working from home thing is going to continue for a whole lot longer. What that means is that you have these two things that are both happening. You have a labor shortage to some degree, and you have a bunch of people who are like, you know what, this has woken me up to what I really want out of life, and it's not this. And I think, again, the message here is that you can no longer use the excuse, oh, well, I work in the food and beverage industry. We just 
We can't create good jobs. Yes, you can. You do not have to accept it. And for every one of those, I can point to a business where they have a line out the door of people applying in that industry, right? Whether it's fast food or hospitality. You know, we we had a, a guy who went through our program who runs a trucking business. The turnover rate in trucking is 70%, right? It's huge. And one of the things he said about going through our program was he said, not only did I turn my turnover program around, but we established such a good relationship. He said, when truckers are mad at you, they just take the long route and charge you for the gas, right? They don't tell you that they're mad. They just take the long route. He said, I'm saving $1,200 a week because my workers aren't pissed at me anymore. Wow. That's right? incredible. So, so it you really- have case studies. We need to... We need to start populating those. I run a nonprofit, any business, but you know, yeah, people, you know, really want to see the difference that that nonprofit is making, not only to engage but to to support. So yeah, and and I think again, the point here is that we're we're making the lives and the work of employees better, which in turn makes the life and work of the employer better, right? A hundred percent. One of the things that every one of our pretend participants is now doing is taking vacations, which they weren't doing before, right? Yeah, and- I, I say you do not let people cash in their vacations. They need that for so many reasons. Right. And, and you and know, listen, my topic is customer and employee experience, but mostly customer experience. And we say what, what's felt on the inside is going to be delivered on the outside. And we got to yes. stop skipping that step and expecting them to deliver great customer experience if we're not giving it to them. And, and, and there's so many new dynamics to that. Right. Like we said, train the whole person, not just the, the, the professional side. Yes, I, I mean, I would literally cheer if I could. I 100% agree with that. And we know that there's a mental health crisis going on in businesses, particularly small businesses. I think Canada just put out a study that said two thirds of small businesses are experiencing a mental health crisis and they're considering closing because of it. So, you know, it's no longer small businesses closing because of finances. It's because they're so stressed out and exhausted and scared that they can't continue. And that, again, that's not good for any of our communities. No, no. And, and mental health care is a privilege for people who can afford it, right? It's not usually part. So there's such a large population who can't pay out of their pocket to right. get there. And, and so many things need to change about that in our healthcare system and, and businesses and, and all those things. It should be right up there with, with health, dental, all those things, it's a real, real thing today and leaders need to address it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, it just we can't emphasize enough. It's, it's both the leaders and the workers. It's understanding that that mental health isn't, isn't on solid ground for either group and we have to fix both. Yeah. Jen, this is awesome. I love what you're about. I love what Work for Humanity is about. Let me again say the Work for Humanity mission is it's time to reimagine the American dream. We're creating a more equitable and enjoyable future of work so that workers, so that workers, businesses, and communities can thrive. You're doing great work. I'm including the in the show notes how to follow you, how to donate, how to get involved with the Work for Humanity. I really appreciate what you're doing. I think it, it, you're just scratching the surface of some great things ahead. Thank you so, so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, revolutionaries, for another episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. We will see you next week. We appreciate your reviews. Please be sure to share your comments and let us know what you're enjoying most on the podcast. And to hear more episodes, be sure to subscribe now on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening and being part of the customer service revolution.